Fill her up. You're listening to the Gas Digital Network. Michael Malice here. Let that be your welcome for the next hour. I am kind of giddy because I had a rule to only do in-studio guests for a long time, but ever since the plague hit, uh, we now have an excuse to talk to people who would not uh, be entering New York City anytime soon. One of them is Stu Berger, who I absolutely adore. Stu is co-host of the Glenn Beck program and star of Stu Does America over at The Blaze. Uh, Stu, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for making the time. Oh, please. Thanks for having me. And I would come to New York for you anytime. Michael. Well, not anytime. <laughs> yeah, well, not now. No, not for a very long time from now, but at any other time. I was just on with uh, our buddy Jesse Kelly this morning on his show. And uh, you are definitely come from the conservative wing. You and Glenn kind of have that certain type of audience. And I love talking to you guys because you have an unorthodox uh, conservative perspective. It's not the corporate conservative perspective that I would expect. What is the mood like over there? Are you optimistic, scared uh, about the election and the direction this country is heading? Um, I would say definitely scared about the way the direction of the country. Um, I don't think we're going uh, in, in the right uh, direction at all. Uh, you know, we keep looking at this as, uh, as we get stuck on the election stuff, which is understandable. It's kind of like the big definitive moment that we're all sort of looking at. But really, we're this whole year has been an utter disaster, right? I mean, like <laughs> we are in a constant, I mean, between the economy and COVID and everything else, we're going down this road where people have given themselves a giant excuse to not care about foundational yeah. principles and things they were supposed to care about, right? It's a nice, easy way to blow off everything you were supposed to care about for the last, you know, century or so. Um, and so it's been, I think one of the, it's been a strange time. Uh, it's been a time where you, have I think, revealed a lot about your, probably yourself. When it goes to the election, you know, I mean, I am terrified of a world in which Joe Biden is the president of the United States and the Democrats have the Senate and the House. That is a terrifying uh, world to me from the perspective of there's going to be no opposition. I think they, they would probably get rid of, of the filibuster, which puts us in a situation where it's a free pass. And I don't like that world at all. I mean, Trump, you know, ha has some things I've liked, I've really liked about Trump. He's ex probably exceeded my expectations coming in. Uh, but I don't think he's a perfect guy. He's not like, I'm never going to be a huge Trump cheerleader per se. Um, but he is a guy, I think, who is, he, he still has a serious chance to come back on this thing. But as we stand right now, he's in a tough spot. I mean, I think any president who's in, in who is in office when you get a, a global pandemic dropped on your head is going to have a difficult time uh, pulling this thing out. I think people, you know, I, when I first started dating my wife, I, when she got in the car for the first time, I mean, she's like, Michael, a thousand miles out of my league. And uh, the first time she got in the car, I made sure to have country music on because I knew she liked it. Now, I don't like country music at all, but I just wanted her to associate her favorite music with me when she got in the car. Uh, you know, it's strategic thinking, I think, at its best. Uh, and it worked, by the way. It's spectrum thinking. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I, some people say it's really pathetic. I think of it as deep spectrum thinking. Uh, and that's the same way I think voters vote a lot of times. Sure. Like, they're in this mode where they're thinking, I've set, sat here for 10 months and my yeah. life has been hell. I'm just going to assign it to the guy who's on TV all the time. Yeah. And I don't think it's a good way of voting, but I, I do think that there's a real risk unless this, unless smiles come back on faces a little bit, it may turn out that way. Let's play a little bit of devil's advocate. The only time we've had a balanced budget in our lifetimes was when we had a Democratic president and a Republican Congress. Uh, the Republicans were very emboldened to fight President Clinton. He wasn't a particular ideologue. I think he was kind of a narcissist and just wanted to make deals just to get ahead. But that ended up happening. Uh, as opposed to right now, when you have the opposite, you have split uh, House and Senate with Republicans, a Republican president. But are, I can't imagine that you're looking at these spending bills and are just like shoulders. Uh, you know, Michael, a lot of people like Donald Trump. 
a lot of people love the guy. He, he didn't even run on being a guy who wanted to control spending. And he has not, he has, he has kept that promise. He has not, uh, he has not tried. I mean, look, we look at this as it's hard to argue that he, and again, it's not just him, it's, it's Congress as well. But we're talking about the worst spending years in American history without any question. Uh, nobody cares about it. Uh, you can't get any, we couldn't even argue to get people to show up to vote for multiple trillions of dollars in spending. Thomas, poor Thomas Massey yeah, almost right. got thrown out of Congress because he said people should show up and vote for trillions of dollars. Uh, that is, I mean, I, I think we all understand this is a crazy time and, and there are a lot of crazy things have, have happened here. And maybe you had to spend some money. Obviously, you know, the government's cl- forcing businesses to close down, sure. kicking people out of their jobs. We understand that there's extenuating circumstances. But to say that we don't even have to vote on something like that is completely nuts. And even if you go before that, we had good times where the economy was good and we were still spending like crazy. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think that tension, you know, no party cares about spending. There's not right. a party that cares about spending. The only party that cares about spending is the Republicans when they're in the minority. Yeah, That's it. Right. When they're in the majority, they don't care at all. And it, it's really frustrating. Um, I think to your point, there is that tension. I mean, you go back to that era. Bill Clinton is on stage saying the era of big government is over, right? Now, he didn't believe that, and certainly nobody around him believed it either. But it was so popular with the American people, he had no choice but to kind of utter it uh, to get more power. Uh, so there was a good tension there. If you had an aggressive Republican Congress that could push back against a president, I mean, a lot of times I think the best thing that can happen is nothing. You know, these guys, when they do something, they screw up everything. And that is something that we keep uh, seeing over and over again. So I, I, I don't mind that construct. I'm not like a Trump you know, cheerleader. I, 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 he's done some good things, uh, but uh, I think he has let the ball drop in, in several areas, spending maybe the biggest one. I'm going to try to get you even more optimistic, mm-hmm. okay? And I think this is something everyone would agree with. Mm-hmm. If you, I have my polls on Twitter, and sometimes they're tough choices, which I pride myself on. And I think this is going to be an easy choice. Mm-hmm. Given that we're at some point going to have a Democratic president, who would you rather have, Biden or Hillary? I would rather have Biden. Yeah, I mean, of course. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I mean, I remember looking back to 2008 when he was running and, and in that field, and I thought actually Biden would have been one of the better candidates out of that field. Um, you know, look, <laughs> Biden is not going to be a good president, and I have no idea where he stands as far as uh, his state right now. It's honestly concerning at times. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. You know, my favorite thing is how when he has no idea what he's saying and he's taken all of the words that he <laughs> wants to say in the paragraph and thrown them all up in the air and they're all landed in different orders. And he gets about halfway to the end of it. He realized he's nowhere close to this point. He just says, ah, I'm out of time. I'm out of, I'm out of time. I'm out of time. It's like, well, no one's even timing you. This isn't even a debate. We're just having a conversation. Uh, it's a great little uh, way he gets out of that. Um, but yeah, like, I think he's a, he's a problem for a lot, of issue, uh, a lot of different reasons. He's had points in his life where he's believed some sane things. You know, we played a clip. Um, I was kind of cataloging the uh, cognitive decline a little bit of Joe. And we played a clip of him in 2008 against Sarah Palin. Yeah. And oh, yeah. I got to say, he looked pretty freaking good. He was on top of it. He was, uh, he, he was able to formulate his thoughts. He showed some emotion when talking about his, his son. And he actually, uh, the other fascinating part about the clip, he starts it by bragging about adding tens of thousands of police officers to the streets and the 1994 crime bill. bill. He's bragging about it to show you how much time, times have changed. But he really has been, he, you know, people are always like, well, he's kind of a moderate. He's sort of a conservative Democrat. He's just old. Yeah. When you've been in office that long, the positions that were liberal at one other time have now turned to be conservative. So whatever was liberal in 1887, <laughs> uh, he's now still, I mean, it's on his record. So you could say at one point he was moderate, but he wasn't moderate for the time. I mean, you know, I, I do think that Biden would be much much preferable to Clinton, but either one to me is not going to make me happy. So would you consider yourself to be a Rutherford B. Hayes Republican? <laughs> a Calvin Coolidge. I, I'm a Calvin Coolidge Republican <laughs> is how I'd like to say that. Because uh, I mean, I, look, I, so that stuff is important, you know, and, and this is a, a funny sort of like a, a collection. I mean, I remember in 2016 thinking I kind of wanted uh, Biden to run 
because Biden 2016 versus Trump 2016 would have been a show. Oh, yeah. I mean, they were both at that time where they were kind of insulting people and gaffing. And I would have loved to have seen that. This matchup, though, in the middle of a pandemic, I mean, the television has been less than than to, than I would like to desire. Uh, there's one thing I'm very, very concerned about, and I'm confident that you are also extremely concerned about this, which is Kamala Harris being the potential for the vice presidency. During the campaign, I had said that she is by far the most evil sociopath on that stage. <laughs> I'm not joking at all. Uh, I think well, any, I, I, it's just a great way of putting it. I think anyone who is comfortable locking up people just to further their own career, as opposed to having an ideological like Giuliani law and order interest in cleaning up New York is right. really extremely disturbing. Uh, the fact that she was just on Colbert, I'm sure you saw this, and he's like, you called him a racist during the debate, and she's just like, ha, 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 it was a debate. It's like, yeah. wait, really? Like, you're just going to be this brazen that you're just like, I just say what I want to get what ahead. That is a very scary uh, proposition. And I had said, I think it would be a smart idea for the Trump campaign to simply run ads that said, we all wonder what Joe Biden would be like as president. And this week with his choice for vice president, he showed us he wants us all to be California and to just go through the horror show that California has become and that she is certainly a representative of, quite literally, obviously, as a senator, but also ideologically. How concerned are you that this was his pick? I think it's very concerning. I mean, I think that we should be writing their ads, by the way. Uh, that's a great <laughs> way of, 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 of approaching it because, you know, people, I think, everyone has this thing in the back of their mind, including Democrats. They're all yeah. saying to themselves, look, we all know he can't do this anymore. Biden is not, it's not, there's something not right. Something's going down the wrong, wrong road. Uh, to me, it was the most consequential vice presidential selection in history, at least in modern history, because we all know that this is a serious possibility. It's not like, Je you know, it's not just uh, Joe Biden's p as, as a pick for Barack Obama was, it was a, it was a little seasoning yeah. to his campaign, right? This is like, we really think this person is going to be president if Joe Biden gets elected. So he could have gone a bunch of different directions. You know, he could have tried to go towards, you know, a lot of people talked early on about Klobuchar, who, yeah. you know, we had Mike Lee on the program, Senator Mike Lee from Utah, who's, you know, probably my favorite constitutionalist uh, in, in the Senate. And we asked him, OK, look at his field. We all know it's pretty much junk. Uh, pick the person you think is closest to the Constitution. And he picked Klobuchar oh, yeah. of the field. So, like, you could have gone that direction, and I think it would have made a lot of sense, but he kind of boxed himself into uh, identity politics when it's like when you're eliminating 50% uh, of the population because you can't pick a guy. Yeah. You're picking, you're eliminating 50% of the remaining population because you can't pick a Republican. You're, you're taking 87% uh, of the remaining Republicans because you basically have to pick a person of color. You're picking from a very small yeah. batch. I mean, there just isn't a lot of people. He didn't. I mean, he was picking random Congress people that nobody heard of was in the yeah. were in the finals. Um, I'm kind of surprised, you know, uh, uh, the pick on Kamala. I think they just feel like the bad stuff about her is already out. And I don't know what the bad stuff is about Tammy Duckworth. She's an amazing uh, story personally. Yeah. She's basically a war hero. Um, yeah, yeah. So it is a you know, she, I, that would have been a a pretty interesting choice and, and, a, and a scary choice for Republicans. Kamala is the type of person, though, where she can she can get. I, mean, I, think, I think Trump's biggest challenge here is that people don't hate Joe Biden. Right. They hated Hillary Clinton. Yes. Joe Biden to them is like ah, he's that guy who always makes all the mistakes. You mean that guy like he, there's no passion against him. There's passion for Trump and against Trump. And Biden is just a placeholder. I think you're right. You run that this campaign as, hey, you're running against California. Do you want your state? They're in the middle of blackouts yeah. right now, brownouts in, in California. You want your state to be that state? Then vote, because this is this is the direction Joe Biden has clearly uh, defined as the direction he wants to go. And I think to most people outside of California, that's a scary direction. Do you know who I think would have been the smartest VP pick for him? Kristen oh. Cinema. Cinema, yeah. You know. Then you get Arizona. Mm -hmm. And then you're really in trouble. And she's got the, she's a veteran. She's bi, so she checks that off, but not like kind of gross. So I, I you know what <laughs> I mean? It's the Michael Malice line of she checks the box, but not kind of gross. No, but I mean like, you know, if someone's coming from identity politics, but they look like they're from a city and it's like, mm -hmm. they look like they've gone to like, like Vassar and it's like, I'm not voting for this. Sure. She yeah. is telegenic. Mm -hmm. uh, she is bright. She's not have a long resume. So you can't really do a lot of oppo research on her. You put Arizona in place. You got the military. She's not scary. 
Uh, she speaks, you know, so I think that would have been a brilliant pick on his part. Yeah, I said that would have been an interesting one. You're right. I mean, she's so new in the Senate and not particularly well known, which may have been why they stayed away. I mean, she had some pretty hardcore left uh, things in her past. Sure. But she seemed to have developed into more of a moderate-ish type of candidate. You know, you never know how much of that is just politics, but that's everybody in this game. So, yeah, no, I think cinema would have been an interesting one. Uh, I think Duckworth would have been interesting. I, You know, P- Klobuchar would have probably been an interesting pick. I mean, some of the ones they were tossing out there, like Karen Bass. It's like, who the heck is Karen Bass? Like, I do this for a living. I never heard her name before. Right. And did you see, I'm positive it was Kamala Harris's fingerprints were all over it because there was all this oppo research dropping on Karen Bass because there was a Scientology church that opened up her district and she just gave a nice talk like, oh, welcome to my district. And they're like, oh, she's a Scientologist. Like, <laughs> this is Karen, this is Kamala Harris's people poisoning the well to make sure she's not a viable alternative. The stuff about Castro, uh, was also mm-hmm. very disturbing to hear. And that didn't just come out of nowhere. That wasn't oh. Republicans doing this. This, oh, was, this, this was her. You are so right, Michael. This, this is Kamala Harris to a T. And this is the thing I'd be most terrified about, not as the country, but if I'm Joe Biden. Because oh, yeah. the second things go wrong, she is going to be uh, against, uh, you know, behind your back to every person in the press, leaking things. If he looks shaky behind the scenes, she will be leaking that to the press. Kamala Harris loves Kamala Harris, and she's going to make sure that every, everything is set up for her the best way possible. If she can get into office as VP and then that later leads to the presidency, fine. But if this thing starts going down the wrong roads, she's going to make sure she is 100 percent clear of blame. And that is really dangerous for Biden and his legacy. Because of how crazy and chaotic politics has become. I always try to imagine what's the most bonkers thing that could happen because sometimes it does happen. Mm -hmm. And it is not at all implausible that next year at this time, it's going to be you on one side of the table and the New York times and the other side of the table arguing over the 25th amendment as Kamala Harris is trying to, and the corporate press is trying to get Joe Biden out of office because of mental incompetence and the right wing is fighting to keep him in office. Yeah. I, you know what? I'll, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> no question out of those two who I'd rather be president between Kamala and Biden. Uh, you know, we were talking to uh, Brian Riedel, who's a, you know, I don't know if you know him, but he's a really smart guy. We one of these budget crunchers. And, and I was like, how extreme is Kamala Harris? He's like, well, let me put it in perspective. When Barack Obama ran for, uh, for, pre- for the president, uh, he, he uh, recommended a, new, a $1 trillion of additional spending, a trillion dollars. Joe Biden is currently offering $6 trillion really? of additional spending. Kamala Harris, when she ran her campaign, promised $40 trillion of additional spending. 40, 40 times Barack Obama. Now, Bernie Sanders was $97 trillion, so she wasn't the worst. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but $40 trillion is a hell of a lot of money. If she gets in control, I mean, you know, she has shown throughout her career, as you pointed out, she will do whatever it takes at any moment to benefit herself and her uh, future. And, you know, that if Biden is, a, is, is tossed to the side on that through a 25th Amendment type of situation, I would not be surprised at all for them and her people to be leaking that stuff behind the, the scenes to get it started. Of course. Um, there, do you see a certain irony, given historically how the parties have uh, taken stance on the issues, that this year you have Biden with the crime bill, Kamala Harris as a prosecutor, as the Democrats, and Trump and prison reform on the yeah. Republicans where he's letting people out of jail. No one seems to be talking about how, how odd that is, that this is how it shook out. Everybody changes every time, yeah. right? It, it seems like they, you know, they, they totally disagree with themselves all the time. I mean, with Harris, too, it's one of those things where, and I think this is true with Biden as well, although he ran to the moderate side, so it wasn't as much. But with, with Harris, she's the type of person where the things used against her in the primary are things that she will advertise during the general. And here she is, a person who, uh, you know, that, that prosecutorial record is being played up by a lot of people in the Trump sphere. But like, you know, traditionally, that hasn't been something that you would necessarily uh, see as the enemy of the typical voter. Right. Now, her excesses in that world are a different thing. I think people are, do not like when you falsify evidence or ignore evidence in major trials. But the idea that she just put people behind you know, bars for drug use and stuff, that hasn't been 
I mean, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a conversation I have with libertarians. Like it's a conversation that's an interesting one to have about what are the right things to do in those situations. You know, I'm much more of a guy who would rather uh, not have any federal laws on those types of things, but still like the American people, generally speaking, are not going to get, Oh, I'm not going to vote for Kamala Harris because, you know, she put criminals behind bars. You know, a lot of, well, that's how it's seen. Um, so it's interesting to see, like, I think in some ways that part of it is somewhat smart strategy for uh, the Democrats, because having some having two people who are uh, friendly to law enforcement wouldn't be a bad thing, considering the Democrats are out there saying defund the police and you have the AOCs of the world giving that impression. Trump is obviously trying to paint them as these are the this is the defund the police crowd. These are the people that are going to be tearing down your statues. That's who they are. And so to bring in people who would say, wait a minute, no, we've got a prosecutor and the guy who wrote the crime bill would actually be an interesting pushback against that. They seem terrified to use it, though, because of their left wing and they don't want to piss them off. I don't know where they're going because they have no they have no passion for Biden anyway. So I don't know why they're worried about that. If I were them, I would be trying to play that up to try to get that middle class voter who might not like Trump that much but it's terrified of defund the beliefs and my, my cities are gonna burn down in two weeks. Hey guys, Michael Malice here. I wanna tell you about something that is near and dear to my feet, Heshi Socks, H-E-S-H-I Socks.com. I wear them all the time. If you go to Heshi Socks.com and use code WELCOME30, you get 30% off your entire order. Here's why they're great. They're very breathable. They're made with high-end Pima cotton. So they're good in cool weather and they're good in warm weather also. Antimicrobial properties keep your feet fresh and smelling right. They've got the fashion-y ones, which I like. They've got the basic ones, which everyone else likes. If you're going to the office, go on a date, going to the gym, Heshi Socks has something that you will like, and they're great supporters of the show. If you go to H-E-S-H-I-Socks.com and use promo code WELCOME30, you get 30% off your order. These are great house socks, I'm not going to lie because they don't wear out in the heel and they're kind of thick, but not thick that your feet sweat. It's really comfortable and something I enjoy wearing. So I practice what I preach. Let's get back to the show. There, there's another silver lining that I want to point out to you uh, and your audience that I think you'll be very happy about. This is a positive show you're doing here, Michael. I I'm love ve- it. I'm very hopeful for the future of this country. And I think it is unfortunate to me that many people on the right are not seeing the broader picture because the right wing historically is about looking at history, learning the lessons and applying them today. And there seems to be much more of this Al Gore hockey stick. Let's look at the last two years and extrapolate them into the future. And I don't think that's the, and I know you don't think that that's the right approach to politics. You have to look at the Rutherford B. Hayes election and what consequences it's had on on today. So, um, you know, for a, a long time, you had extreme radicalism on the left to the point of defending Stalin and Stalinism, right, in the 30s. Like, I mean, this isn't, this isn't just let's uh, not have people pay for college. This is radical Soviet-style communism. Yeah. And when you had these people behind the scenes, you would have outlets like The New Yorker, The New York Times, and then later, you know, other uh, establishments telling the population, oh, it's fine, this is just a different perspective. We're to this day taught in schools that in the McCarthy era, when people who wanted to have the Soviets take over this country, to have a violent revolution, which would lead to genocide gulags and the appropriation of all property, that they couldn't get a job was the worst injustice that's ever happened in this country other than slavery. We're still taught this with a straight face. Oh, because they just had a different political opinion. You know, (laughs) no, they're just pro-choice or something like that. And now you will have these radical perspectives. Now, radicals inherently mean wrong about defund the police and just a total different approach to policing in the neighborhoods. And you'll have John Oliver and you'll have CNN go on and tell you, when they say defund the police, they just mean spend more money on public schools. Mm -hmm. And then you will have the activists say, no, we mean defund the police. Uh, AOC will say, we don't mean budget tricks. This is not enough. We want to defund the police. So to me, when you have the average person hearing and being able to make an honest choice, this is actually what we stand for, as opposed to Walter Cronkite, Dan Rather, Brian Williams, and all these people for decades saying, oh, everything's fine. You're just being hysterical. 
that to me is also a huge modicum of hope. Yeah, and I totally agree with you on that. I mean, the best friend that we have to try to defend against that is these people admitting what they believe, right? Yeah. I think that's an incredible, that's an incredible uh, thing for us right now. I mean, I, there was a piece that I think Vox wrote uh, called uh, what, it, what It Means to Be a Democratic Socialist uh, from a Democratic Socialist. And it was a Democratic Socialist who wrote it. And she said quite clearly, no, it's not FDR-style liberalism. No, no uh, it's not even close to that. We want to end capitalism, period. Uh, and it goes through it in explicit detail written in a, you know, a, a somewhat left-wing, a mainstream left-wing uh, site. I, like, that sort of thing is really important for the Americans, uh, American people to hear because they don't, they, we have that normalcy bias, right, where we kind of tend to think, like, okay, well, they can't be that bad. I'm totally guilty of this. Like, I, I, I my initial instinct when I see people talking on the left, I'm like, well, you know, what, but what are they trying to say? I try to understand it. I try to give them the treatment that I would appreciate when maybe I say something that isn't fully explained with all the, the appropriate disclaimers. And of course they never give that to us. But I mean, I wanna understand, I wanna know where these things are. And you realize as you go down these roads, they really do want this stuff. I mean, the AOCs of the world, and she's not a great example because I don't know that, how, you know, I don't know how, how deep her thought level is on this stuff, but many, or on anything, but many people uh, really do believe this stuff. And it's, it's kind of scary. and and. and you, know, we, you went back and you started this with what is your, uh, are you positive for the future of the country? In the way that we were talking about when it comes to elections and stuff, I'm not at all, um, you know, uh, positive for the future of the country. I think our politics are, are crazy. And I know you like that. So, I mean, you, you're going to, you're going to like the crazy politics and everybody attacking each other. Yeah. But where I do come to the positive um, part of this is like how much good has happened recently. I mean, billions of people across the world have been taken out of poverty you know, we've advanced, uh, you know, uh, our ability, I mean, we wouldn't know this right now, but our ability to fight diseases and, 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 and do so many great things where like, you know, you're talking about, you know, people when it comes to poverty and it comes to children dying before they're 10 years old, all across the world, so much good has come in that arena in such a short time. It is like legitimately the greatest human accomplishment in history. And it's something we never discuss or talk about. So much of that has come from capitalism and free trade and things of that nature that now are being sort of tossed to the side and ignored um, as, as, you know, side, sidelines to our post office debate of the day. And I, I, so I have real hope that if we can keep just the basic bones of this thing together, we will, this will continue. And even if we wind up hating each other, we wind up hitting each other on dumber and dumber things. Like it used to be that the people they make statues of were actually keeping slaves. Now we're just mad at the statues of them. No one's keeping the slaves. The statues are there. I'd much rather hate each other over statues than actual slavery. Uh, something that I've been very kind of optimistic about as well is the relationship between conservatives and the police. Uh, when I was on with Glenn a couple months back when I was in Texas at the studio, you know, just discussing things like no-knock raids, uh, the mm -hmm. militarization, the police. For a long time, because the police were basically whipping boys for the left, I feel like there were a lot of conservatives who felt it was their role because they're the only ones to run interference and be like, they have a tough job. You guys aren't giving them a fair shake. They're always the bad guys. This is ridiculous. But then now increasingly, especially as police are the ones who are willing to be the only ones to enforce gun, gun laws and disarm people, uh, I think things like Castle Doctrine and things like the ATF are things that many conservatives are increasingly being like, wait, hold on a minute. Uh, we, we can defend the people who have these roles, but these roles are certainly not constitutional and are things that I find extremely disturbing. It's also kind of unfortunate that this has, by design in the corporate media, has become so intertwined with race. And that it's kind of like, if I'm gonna criticize the police, I have to give credence to this whole racism narrative. And it's like, you're not giving me the space to kind of be like, I'm not comfortable with this. And I don't care what color it is that these people are being kind of shot at who are you know, defenseless. How has your perspective of the police changed you know, recently or over time? Uh, it's a great question. I, it's been such an interesting, uh, you, know, you know, last couple of months have been really interesting on that front. You know, uh, I think a lot of times the, you'll see like people, NBA players come out and they'll be like, hey, say their name. And they'll list off five or six people who have been in controversial, well-known um, uh, you know, incidents with police or, or racially motivated incidents. And included in that all the time is Breonna Taylor. 
Yeah. And I didn't really know the Brianna Taylor story really at all. So I kind of set out to kind of do a show. We did one called Stu Does Brianna. Uh, the, I didn't do Stu Does Brianna Taylor. I thought the naming, our naming, that was one one time I was like, let's do Stu Does the Truth about Brianna Taylor. Today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't feel like our namings convention really worked in that particular case. Um, but uh, you know, so I w- looked into that. And when you really look into it, what you find is the it, it is not the BLM critique of the police that was associated with that incident. It was the libertarian yeah. critique of the police, the you know the Radley Belko yes. uh, critique of the play, of, of the police, the militarization, the idea that like I you know I think there's a really good idea um, when you really look at the details of that is they weren't even shooting at Breonna Taylor, like they were shooting at the guy who actually shot the officer. The question though is why the hell were they there at that point doing that thing at that time in the middle of a pandemic, no less, for a small time drug crime? I mean, it made no sense for them to be doing that raid in the first place. And that comes back to the rules and the in the practices that have been going on with police. So I, you know, I, I've had I have relatives who are police officers. Um, some of my favorite people in the world are police officers, and I think a lot of them are the best people among us. And I do think that at times they get really, really rough goes of it from the media, uh, in in in, un, in unfair fashion. Um, but the practices there around that, there's no need to put. I mean, you look at that situation, no need to put Brianna Taylor in a situation where she's getting a knock in the middle of the night uh, out of a you know sound sleep to get up and try to figure out what the hell is going right. on when someone's breaking down her door. There's no need to put um, a, a legal gun owner, her boyfriend, in that position where she thinks, because she he did exactly what I would have done in that situation. If someone was breaking down my, my door at, at 1230 with not, not knowing who it was, I'd be firing through that door too. And there's also no need to put our police officers in that situation right. where they wind up getting shot over what, uh, you know, none of that makes sense. And so I do think that there is a real, there's been that uneasy sort of alliance in some ways between, hey, we want small government and, hey, we trust, trust the cops and no matter what they do and they always do the right thing. That's obviously not, that's not the right uh, approach. It is, I think, to right to change those policies and make them not only friendly to law abiding citizens, but friendly to the police. So they're not putting their lives at risk for no reason. Um, and on the other side of that, we have to make sure that those things are treated as individual incidents instead of like, the, we love building these narratives of like, well, police are, ba- are, are bad towards black people. And you know, like those, what do those narratives mean? Like I, I'm an individual, right? Bri- Brianna Taylor was an individual. The, the, the sad thing about her dying is not, is not because of her race. It's because of who she was as a person, an individual who, who deserves the right to live. Uh, that is what's wrong with that case. And I think we have to look at these things much more um, as individual matters than trying to build grand narratives. Hey guys, Michael Malice here. I want to tell you about something that is near and dear to my feet, Heshi Socks, H-E-S-H-I Socks.com. I wear them all the time. If you go to HeshiSocks.com and use code WELCOME30, you get 30% off your entire order. Here's why they're great. They're very breathable. They're made with high-end Pima cotton. So they're good in cool weather and they're good in warm weather. Also, antimicrobial properties keep your feet fresh and smelling right. They've got the fashiony ones, which I like. They've got the basic ones, which everyone else likes. If you go in the office, go on a date, go in the gym, Heshi Socks has something that you will like and they're great supporters of the show. If you go to H-E-S-H-I Socks.com and use promo code WELCOME30, you get 30% off your order. These are great house socks, I'm not going to lie, because they don't wear out in the heel and they're kind of thick, but not thick that your feet sweat. It's really comfortable and something I enjoy wearing. So I practice what I preach. Let's get back to the show. Uh, one of the arguments that they have against President Trump is that he is like an unprecedented attack on our nation's institutions. But before he was put into office, Harry Reid removed the filibuster uh, for you know presidential nominees, which had been the case other than the Supreme Court for 200 years. Uh, he was warned not to do this by Mitch McConnell. He said, someday we'll be in power and you're going to wish you had it. And he's like, well, I'm doing it anyway. And Mitch McConnell you know, removed it for the Supreme Court. And then you got Brad Kavanaugh. One of the things I am extremely concerned about which has become um, increasingly normalized among the Democratic Party, is this idea of packing the court. That as soon as you get a Democratic president and a Democratic Senate, we're just going to make the Supreme Court 20 people. As you know, and as many people don't know, there's no constitutional requirement the Supreme Court has to be any size. You can just, by decree, double it, pack it, and then 
you know, I guess the next Republican president is just going to have to double it again, um, <laughs> you know, make it a, the House of Representatives at a point. Like, we laugh, but, like, where does it stop? I mean, how much of a – that must be an enormous concern for you. Yeah, I mean, an incredible concern. I mean, obviously, we had outward – uh, promises by presidential candidates like Buttigieg and others who said they would do that. I mean, they, <laughs> that is, you know, it's funny. These, these ideas come and go. And I know, you know, history so well that like you, you've seen this happen too. You know, when it says, you know, the, the era of big government is over, it never, it's not over. Right. They're waiting for their time to come back with these other ideas. The FDR packing the court thing had been an embarrassment for the Democrats for half a century. And now it's back and because this time it's just too important. You know, I think even if they don't try to pack the court, um, the idea that they'd get rid of the filibuster and just pass things through would get a lot done as well. The packing the court thing is, is, is terrifying. And it, it, the problem with it, there's no limiting principle right. to it, right? Like, it's just a matter of we'll just keep doubling it. Soon we'll all have jobs as Supreme Court justices. That's, the, you know, that happens really quick when you start doubling things. Um, I, you know, I think you could look at this and say, the American people would probably be very supportive of an idea of a constitutional amendment to keep the rules the same, right? There's nine, you know, like something where you could actually make this fundamentally uh, a, 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 a situation where people understand it, you know, um, going into this, they, the left is freaked out because they say we have this liberal or this conservative Supreme Court. Well, I would love for them to show up one of these days. I mean, that would be, that'd be fantastic. Uh, I, I don't see them as an overly conservative Supreme Court at all. Uh, in fact, you know, with Roberts uh, on the court, it seems like, you know, they keep saying Roberts sides with the liberals. Well, you got to stop saying that when he's on that side as much as he's not on that side. Eh? You know, he, it's really not a surprise anymore. So I do really think um, the attack on institutions uh, is, is a serious issue. It goes to the way they keep saying, well, Donald Trump is not going to he's not going to respect this election. He's not going to re respect this election. I don't remember an election when I was alive that a Democrat lost and respected the results. I, I mean, at least in my voting years, I mean, to, uh, to Al Gore in 2000, uh, Bush stole the election. People forget John Kerry in 2004, who lost Ohio. Yeah, the, the voting yeah. machines were all faked. Exactly. And, the, and there was pamphlets they found that said Democrats should vote on Wednesdays. Uh, we don't know what could have happened. That was a big thing for a while. And obviously, uh, Hillary Clinton has been on TV every 10 minutes telling everybody how the Russians did it and you know, all the other, how it was all about, you know, we didn't want a woman president or whatever excuse she's come up with in the last 12 minutes. They don't respect institutions at all. They respect themselves. They respect their own power. Well, for, for, I think th these are just two fundamental approaches. The conservatives respect institutions, they're more traditionalist, whereas the left, if, for 100 years, views institutions as a means to an end, that end being the imposing their vision of what this country or this world should look like. And insofar as the institution furthers that end is of use, insofar as it hinders that uh, end, it needs to be modified until it furthers that end. So it is in many ways, uh, you know, going viral is one of the few words in the English language that has an extremely positive connotation an extremely negative connotation. You know, if a video goes viral, it's really popular. If someone's going viral, well, let's kind of get their will ready, right? Mm -hmm. But it does operate like a virus. It'll, it'll, it'll latch onto a host and then reorganize it in order to further kind of the agenda. And I think uh, increasingly on the right, there is an understanding that this is how they look at things by the nature of their ideology. That it's not simply, I want A, you want B. It's like, oh, you look at things, at math, differently than how I look at math. Totally true. I think I've come to that conclusion uh, more since probably just this year. Um, yeah. I mean, I think you understand it at some level, but to see it in action, like the way that, I mean, the, the way that the, the term racism is being redefined. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, we all, like conservatives and liberals had come to a point, I thought, in which we all said, okay, like, this is a really bad thing. I can't believe it ever happened. Like, anyone who's a racist is a total idiot. And we were all kind of in the same place on that, I thought. And then they were like, well, it's not working as well because everyone's in the same place. So what if we totally redefine the word? What if we go this sort of white fragility route where we can kind of just say, you're automatically a racist if you're a white person. And if you're not doing the, the X, Y, and Z policy concerns that we want, well, then you're not an anti-racist and therefore you're just as bad as David Duke. And it's like, well, you know, they're talking about in New York uh, getting rid of the blind audition for an orchestra. 
which is like the most merit-based thing possible. You'd think that would be the dream of Martin Luther King. It's all content and no color of skin because you can't see who it is. You just hear the instrument, the most perfectly defined, uh, you know, colorblind thing you could imagine. They want to get rid of that because they want to say, no, we do want to consider uh, race in this, uh, in this idea. You know, they, they, they talk openly about this, um, about, uh, about how the only solution for present discrimination is future discrimination. That is, that's totally against, it's a full frontal assault on Martin Luther King and what he uh, envisioned. And I, I keep coming to the conclusion that within five years, 10 years, they're going to be ripping down MLK statues because he's going to stand for, not for what they stand for now, he's going to stand for the conservative vision of what racism is and isn't. And that's no longer okay. I mean, you just saw, I'm sure, just recently they amended the California state constitution, which banned discrimination. And now they're like, they to amend the constitution to unban discrimination, I think it, it's, it speaks exactly to your point. This isn't something that some kind of, you're not some, talking some right-wing fever dream. This is actually being implemented, has been implemented already. And th that was incredible. I mean, the most basic thing that people would agree on that you shouldn't, you know, discriminate on color of skin and, 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 and basis of religion and sexuality and all these things. And there it is being ripped out of the constitution without really any fanfare and not even a close vote. It really wasn't even a close vote. That's terrifying, honestly. And, you know, I, I you know, looking, it's, you know, you see examples of this all over the place, this new version of these uh, fundamental things. You know, as we got into the COVID era, I think it really, um, and then we had the riots and, and the protests and everything after George Floyd. One of the, generally speaking, well-intentioned thing, you go to on any delivery app, right? Any food delivery app, go to DoorDash. You open it up, top of the thing says, here's a list of Black-owned restaurants. Now, I understand that is a good, that comes from a good place for most people, right? Most people are saying, you know, like, this is terrible, and I, I, I stand with their right to, you know, Black Lives Matter, of course, and you know, let's help out people who are in these situations and blah, blah, blah. So first of all, I hate the idea of, it's just a collectivist idea. Like the person who owned the restaurant was not the person involved in this. And that's a totally different situation. But do we want to be a country in which we choose our hamburgers based on the color of the skin of the owner? Right. That to me sounds fundamentally flawed. It seems like something we've tried before here in, in America and did not work out well. Uh, I don't know if anyone realizes like back in the day, that was the situation. People were going to white-owned restaurants. There were signs on the doors to keep certain colors out. That is a bad human instinct. And, in, and it's like the reverse of what we all, I thought we were all striving for, even though there's good intentions behind that. Eat the burger that tastes the best, not the one that has the preferred skin color you're trying to, uh, to, to, to support at one time. That's a bad precedent. And I would think that minorities of, of, of all sorts would see that more clearly than anybody. Because if, if it turns against you, it's not going to be fun. It's not a good idea. And I, you know, I think that, that changing of the sort of foundational, uh, you know, uh, the floor of where, that we're all walking on and making it you know, uh, liquid instead of solid is not a good idea. I think what they're trying to do, uh, which is crafty on their part, is forcing people to say, here are your choices. Like that White Fragility book speaks to this. You're either for white supremacy, supremacy or you're for white submission. And since no one wants white supremacy because it's an absurdity and, and leads to murder and then horrible mm -hmm. things, well, by default, then you have to choose this other one. And they are forcing people to perceive themselves in a racial context when people like me, I know you've lived in New York for many years, you don't think of yourself in these terms because when you live in these cities, they're so diverse. It's, it's, this is not how you perceive yourself. Yeah, no, I think you're totally right. And, and I, nor do I want to, you know, I, I had a, my daughter is seven. She went to a camp this year and uh, she's at camp and she comes back and she starts telling me a story about this kid. And it's, she says it's the, the first time she's ever had a, someone, a kid have a crush on her. Aww. And I'm like, Oh my God, like, this is a real moment. I this is incredible. So she's telling me the story. She's describing him. She's describing how much she likes his hair, but you know, I don't really like him that much. And he did this and, he, you know, the typical boy yeah. thing of like taunting her. And like, it, it's this, it's prototypical how you would describe a little kid, you know, crush. Um, and, you know, so she, we go through this whole thing and this has gone, you know, it's a couple of weeks, they're at camp together and it's, it's, it's adorable. 
So my wife goes to pick, uh, pick him up, and she says, oh, there he is. And he's walking in, and he's black. Now, my daughter described this boy to me 10 times and never once thought to say his skin color. At no point was that relevant to her at all. And now we have schools yeah. all across the nation that are taking kids at seven years old and making them take diversity classes and trying to put into them this idea that all races are all different and you need to look at the race and don't ignore the race because that's a bad idea. I find that to be crushing, honestly, as a parent. Um, you know, to, to, like that is just like, why insert that into their lives when they don't feel it? When we've done, we've tried so hard as parents and I think so many parents today have to keep that out of the way they think of the world. Uh, now they're trying to insert it back in. And I think that's just as disturbing as the, uh, the alternative. They're also going to teach that boy that if your daughter doesn't reciprocate, it's because she's prejudiced uh, and that she hates him because of who he is, not because she's seven and isn't looking to get engaged at that age. Uh, and sure, that, by the way. Right. And that, she, that he should feel comfortable hating her and being upset if she doesn't respond in kind to the point where he might even be comfortable telling the teacher. And this might become a whole incident. You can see these dominoes being put into place very, very easily. Um, and I, the other thing that I, I, I was, again, I was talking with Jesse Kelly earlier this morning. The other thing that I'm, makes me hopeful for the future of this country is that there's now more alternatives to government schools. With the shutdown of schools, with the pandemic, people increasing homeschooling and finding alternative arrangements. And yes, dude, it, it, is, it, it, it should be it's disturbing to the extreme to have a seven-year-old come home and realize, wait a minute, you know, this is what she's going to be taught. And this is how she's going to be trained to perceive herself before she even has her first training bra. I mean, this is mm -hmm. really, uh, I think, very, very twisted and sick that someone who hasn't even hit double digits in age has to start perceiving things in terms of identity politics and perceiving yeah. him as inherently different and antagonistic to her interests. Yeah, I mean, we're filling these kids with this. They don't have it in them, and we're putting it there. That was the problem back in the day, right? Like, this is the problem when you go back to the 40s and the 50s, and that was what was going on. Um, and, I, you know, to your point on education, I'm totally with you. You know, I, uh, as a guy who's, who believes in, you know, uh, private over public and everything from pools to bathrooms, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, I want private. Um, and so, you know, one of the first things I did when I had any money at all, well, the first thing I did when I had money was never mow my lawn again because I hated it. But other than that, the only one of the main things I did was we, when our kids were born, we said we sat down and I said, you know, like I've been talking about how I believe in private over public for a long time. Maybe like we should actually like step up yeah. and put our kids in private school. And, it, you know, it's a difficult uh, decision because you cheap. start adding up the money oh, yeah. over the entire time they're in school and it starts to get really intimidating. And we, my, my wife and I talked about it and we said, like, look, we'll just do it for now. We'll give them this foundation. If, if things are working out great and we love the school, we'll go on with it. If, if, uh, you know, if, we, if I you know, lose my job next week, well, you know, whatever, we'll have to cut it off at some point. But we'll, we'll, we'll judge it by there. Now, I feel like it's the best money I spend every single year. Um, I, would, I will be living under a bridge sending that, yeah. those kids to that school before I go another direction because it is out of control, even in places like Texas, where they are filling these kids' brains with stuff out of the white fragility handbook. Yeah. It is actually happening in these schools. And look, you're, you're a parent. You have a big role in this. You can, you can help try to deflect as much of that as you can. But when you're in a public school, there's nobody to answer right. uh, for, for this stuff. And, you know, I, I would much rather have as much control as possible. A lot of parents do the homeschooling thing, which I, I think is a great idea, too. I, I would be terrible at it. My wife would be worse. Uh, but uh, I think it would be it's one of those things that Americans are you know, like noticing this now. And with the coronavirus thing, they have. There's a lot of these little pods popping up. Yep. There's a lot of other alternatives, and luckily people are looking for them now. The New York Times is engaged in a public coup on our nation's history with their 1619 project, mm. where the goal is to perceive America as foundationally and inherently based on slavery and racism. And once you accept that premise, all those other dominoes fall into place really easily. You've done the lion's share of the work instead of it being about 1776 or 1789. And if that is then the New York Times give the marching orders to a lot of people, a lot of blogs, a lot of other papers, CNN, 
then those kids get home and, and then the school teachers, they want to be, you know, worldly, they want to be sophisticated, they read the New York Times, then they port that to the schools and to the kids. So if you have someone who's 10 and they're being taught at school that you're doing well in school because someone who had the same shade as you owned slaves 200 years ago, that's sure going to do a number on someone who doesn't really even know the difference between boys and girls. So I, I think people need to appreciate just how pervasive and extreme what they're trying to do is. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I will say, uh, you make the announcement right now. I, I, am, I will submit a pre-order for a, a Michael Malice book about the 1619 Project. <laughs> I will I'll put that order in right this second. So you think about that. I would love, love to have that book. Um, but you're right. I mean, I mean they, they fund, I mean, think about this. Think of how, what a difficult time it is for a kid to grow up and, and uh, have any opinion of themselves that's not a disaster with yeah. social media and all the other things that they have to deal with, right? It's already difficult. Now, it's, it's difficult to be a good person, right? If that's all you're trying to do, it's difficult to do. Add into that the idea that now these, these kids feel responsible for generations of people they never have met, have no relationship to, uh, people who weren't even related to them. They may have come from another country later on, and they're still responsible for slavery when they're, you know, they're res they're, they, the relatives weren't even in the country. Add that stuff on, and it's, so much of the fear-mongering and all the other nonsense that gets pushed on them, it's, a, it's amazing that they're able to handle it as well as they are, and I do feel like it goes the other direction quickly. This has become, you know, I think it was uh, Tablet Magazine did a piece on, on this that we covered where these words like, you know, white privilege and, uh, you know, even white supremacy and, and, uh, and all of this, you know, sort of white fragility language basically was not in our culture at all from the 1970s up until about 2010, 11, yeah. 12, 13. And from that period, the New York Times, the Washington Post saw increases of 1500 percent. Yeah on these terms. They've just totally changed the language and the way the news is reported. And we all kind of look at that and make, it starts out with us making fun of it. And then all of a sudden it's the thing they're being taught in schools and it doesn't seem so fun anymore. Yeah. And it's also interesting. It's like, why am I responsible for slavery, but not responsible for abolition? Like, why would my, I wasn't born in this country, but like, why, if I had been, how, why are you saying I'm a New Yorker? Why would my great, great, great grandpa be from Charleston? Not that I have people against, against anything as people from Charleston. And why wouldn't they be with William Lloyd Garrison? Like for you to ascribe inherently, not to mention that many people in the South didn't own slaves at all. Like, but that's, let's even forget about that. They were just like poor white trash. And I'm, I'm sorry for using that term. There's no better term. Uh, why do they have to be the plantation owners specifically or like rah, rah, rah slavery as opposed to people who are like, this is horrible. We need to do what we can, including taking up arms to destroy this peculiar institution. It's, it's yeah. very interesting how right. that's presented. I mean, there's so many of our founders that were, were abolition. I mean, Ben Franklin, I love freaking Ben Franklin. I mean, he's, a, he's an amazing he's guy. A um, yeah. He's a lech. He's a lech. That's kind of why, though, yeah. right? <laughs> I like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, here's a guy who fought you know, against his own business interests to, to, to fight against slavery. He just didn't care. He just, you know, he was constantly fighting against it. There's many, many, some of these statues that have been torn down have been people who fought against slavery. Uh, it really has no rhyme or reason. And they talk about reparations all the time. And it, it, there's like this idea that, okay, well, I guess white people would be paying black people for slavery, even though they're not in this, you know, they had nothing to do with it. And their parents had nothing to do with it. And their grandparents had nothing to do with it, but someone way in the past did. And we have to even out that wrong. Okay. How does that work within the American Constitution? Like, you can't pass a bill that says black, people with this color skin receive uh, tax dollars directly right. from people of another color of skin. What about people, you know, who had, who aren't re relatives? What about people who are of mixed race? What about people who came from, you know, Jamaica or some other area? None of this makes any sense. It's clearly just a guise for another massive redistribution program. Like it's it's to, to associate people's uh, obvious and correct um, understanding that slavery was an inherent evil, and take that and place it on top of here's the nine programs that I want and here's all the money that I need for them. Um, you know it, that sort of stuff is dangerous and it really does screw with the historical legacy of slavery. We should just all freaking agree it was really really bad, but we should not assign guilt on us for people who were, you know, generations and generations before. And, you know, in, in your case, my parents, my, you know, my, my family came from Sweden. 
um, long, long ago. Uh, but uh, we're not slave owners, at least <laughs> as I know. Uh, you weren't even, you know, you're, you were born in another yeah. country. Like, should you be paying these reparations dollars? I mean, this is just obviously crazy, but it, it's not about making sense. And that's what's been so frustrating about the last couple of years. They're not even trying. Right. The concept of reparations means if I borrow your bike, Stu, and I break your bike and it's $200, I give you $200. It kind of sucks. You have to buy a new bike. We shake hands, but we're cool. Yep. You have been restored. Mm -hmm. There's no one who will say with a straight face that if we have reparations and this money is paid to people who are direct descendants of slaves, let's suppose they did all the math somehow, like, okay, we're taking it directly from Jefferson Davis's grandkids directly to, you know, uh, you know, someone else's grandkids. Well, we're squared. Racism is done. We're not going to talk about it. It's been resolved. That would be what reparations means in real terms. But that's not even that. I mean, the claim that that would be a consequence of this massive payout of money is laughable on its face. Yes, uh, you're 100 percent right. There's never going to be there's no end to this. Right. Right. There's no end to it. You know, there's like there is. You could say, you know, activists fought for equal rights and, 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 you know, against slavery and all these things. And obviously those things went away and those are really good. And all the terrible racist crimes that this country has committed uh, in real terms. Um, some of that, there's obviously still racism around, but many of those, especially institutional uh, areas, it has gone away, thankfully. But there's never going to be a point where they're like, all right, you know what? I guess we're good. Like, it's all worked out pretty well. And uh, thanks guys for making that up. Like. That's not a thing. And nor should it be a thing because I can't make it up. You know why? Because I didn't do anything. I had nothing to do with it. Right. I had absolutely nothing to do with it. I am not going to, I do enough stupid crap in my own life. I don't need to get blamed for stuff of people a thousand years ago that I didn't know. You know, I mean, like that is not right. It's, you know, fundamentally this country was based on the idea that you don't, are not responsible for the crimes of your parents or your grandparents. Yeah. Like it's not supposed to be a legacy country. Um, you know, I think the, the, the idea of equal opportunity is not something that is desired anymore by the far left. They want not even equal outcomes. They want inequal outcomes. Yes. Um, and that is, uh, it's not something that I can get on board on. And it's nice to see what people like Terry, Terry Cruz come out and, and talk up the way he has, because that's really important, you know, because we should be just judging people as individuals. I am not a collectivist. I, to me, racism is collectivism. That's, it is, it is fundamentally one of the more uh, horrible parts about it, right? This is seeing people as parts of groups instead of seeing people as, as individuals. That is what we should be shooting for. And the left seems to want to direct us more and more to what group are you in? How have you been a victim of X, Y, and Z? That's not healthy. And it's also a far left-wing thing. I, I love these, you know, the people uh, who are, crazy, you know, supposed right-wing KKK members that are always associated with the right. It's like, what world does a constitutional conservative who wants small government want anything to do with this craziness? Where, where it's like, you know, like the Charlottesville thing, they're, they're called alt-right. I mean, I don't, you know, you wrote a great book about this type of stuff, uh, but like, it's not associated with what I'm talking about. It has nothing to do with it. I want, a, I want a country where the government is so small they can't bother you, right? Hitler did not have that government. No. He had a much different vision of what the government should do. It was pretty intrusive and pretty large and pretty powerful. I want the opposite of that. So no matter how dumb our politicians are, that sort of crap can't happen. And the way to stop this is voting for the oldest white man in 150 years <laughs> who's been nominated uh, by either party. Um, Stu, we're running out of time. What has been your favorite part of this interview? Oh, I've loved this conversation. And I, the only thing I can think of to say right now is a giant thank you. You are welcome. <laughs>